Hey everyone, I'm Mr. A, and today I want to talk about inverse trigonometric functions, or inverse trig for short. Now, if you don't already know what a sine, cosine, or tangent are, you should go back and watch my introductory basic trig video. I'll put the link in the description. If you're already familiar with sine, cosine, and tangent, we're going to build on that knowledge today and talk about the inverse of those three trigonometric functions. Before we get into that, let's do a quick review of what a function and an inverse function are to begin with. So if we take a look at a basic function like say f of x equals 2x plus 4, remember a good way to think about the way a function works is as an input-output machine. So there's some input that goes into the function, the function does whatever it does, and it produces some output. In the case of the function 2x plus 4, if we put the number 5 in, this becomes 2 times 5, which is 10, plus 4, and we get a 14 out. Let's say this is f of x, the original function, f of 5 equals 14. Now this function, x minus 4 over 2, this is actually the inverse of 2x plus 4. That means that it undoes the original function. If we were to plug in 14, that is to say the output of the original function as the input for this one, well, 14 is x, so 14 minus 4, that's 10 in the numerator, 10 over 2 is 5, and you see that the output is 5, exactly the opposite of what happened here. An inverse function is a function that undoes the original function. In this example here, f of x takes 5 and sends it to 14, right? So the mapping here is that 5 goes to 14, f of 5 is 14. This function takes 14 and sends it back to 5. In other words, this function says, hey, if you got a 14 out of the original function, what's the number that you put into it? And the answer is 5. So an inverse function is a question. The inverse function asks the question, what input created this output? So keeping those two things in mind, that an inverse function undoes the original function, and essentially an inverse function is asking a question. The question is, what input created this output? Again, here, we had an output of 14, right? That was the output of the original function. If we put that to the inverse function, it tells us what the original input was. That is to say that if you put a 5 into the original, you get out a 14. If I have a 14, what did I have to put in? It must have been a 5. Let me also take a minute to introduce the notation for an inverse function because it's a little bit unfortunate. So if f of x is the original function, then the way I would write the inverse is I would call this one f inverse of x. Now, I know that that looks like f to the negative 1 power, but that is not what it means. We just happen to use that same notation for the two different things in mathematics. It's a little bit unfortunate, but there's only so many ways to write things in the world, so sometimes we have two ways that look the same, but they mean very different things. So if you see f with a little negative 1 there, it doesn't mean 1 over the function. It's not the reciprocal. It's the inverse. This is the inverse function of f, and it would be correct in this case to say that the inverse of f of 14 is 5. In other words, f of 5 is 14, which means that the inverse of f is going to have to take 14 and send it back to 5, the original input. So with that in mind, let's take a look at our three trigonometric functions, the sine, the cosine, and the tangent. Now, all three of these functions always have an input that is an angle. That's really critical to remember for these. We have to put an angle into the sine or the cosine or the tangent because they're based in a right triangle. These are ratios of the opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, or opposite over adjacent sides in a right triangle. And what they output for us is a number. That number is always between negative and positive 1, but for now we just need to remember that it's always going to be a number. Well, at least it's true for these two, negative 1 to positive 1. Tangent can give you actually anything. So now if we look at our three inverse trigonometric functions, they're going to have to do what an, what an inverse function does. They're going to have to undo the original function. So remember that sine, cosine, and tangent, the original three trigonometric functions, have an input that's an angle and an output that's a number. Well, the inverse trigonometric functions are going to have the opposite relationship. We're always going to input a number into these functions. That's why I changed these to x's instead of thetas. And we're always going to output an angle. So these are going to take a number and tell us what angle would have created that number if we put it into the function. For example, if you were to take your calculator and type sine of 30 in, as long as you are in degree mode, your calculator will tell you that the sine of 30 is 1 half. So if we then say to the calculator, tell me what the inverse sine of 1 half, remember in this one it was sine of 30, that's an angle, and then I get a number out. The inverse function, I'm going to put this number in. I'm going to say, hey, inverse sine of 1 half, 
And if you did that in your calculator, it will tell you 30. That's what an inverse function is doing. It is undoing the original. So the original function says, hey, sine of 30 is a half. The inverse function is going to take a half and get you back to 30. So it's answering the question, where did this one half come from if I'm using the sine function? What, what angle has a sine that is a half? So this notation again, sine to the negative one, remember that's your inverse sine. Another way you'll see that written sometimes is arc sine, A-R-C-S-I-N of X. This means exactly the same thing as this. There are just two different ways to write that. And what it means is the angle whose sine is X. You can also think of that as asking the question, what angle has a sine of X? The way we get to this is with the sine cosine tangent buttons on our calculator, but if you look closely, you'll see that there is a little sine with a negative one and cosine with a negative one and tangent with a negative one. The way that you access those is by hitting the second key on the calculator. And if you hit second, that'll access these blue commands. So how is this useful? Well, take a look at this triangle here. What if I wanted to find angle A, right? So I know that this side is 17, this side is 13, but I'd like to know what angle A is. Well, with regard to angle A, 13 would be the opposite side over here. 17 would be the adjacent side. So opposite and adjacent would let me use tangent. So here's something that's true. The tangent of angle A is 13 over 17, but it doesn't help me, right? I mean, what I really want to know is what's A. I know what the tangent is. In other words, I know the answer of what the tangent of A is. What I'd like to know is what's the angle that got me that answer. I want to know what angle has a tangent of 13 over 17. Luckily, there's a way to find out. All I need to do is pick up my calculator and I'm going to ask it, what is the inverse tangent of 13 over 17? You'll hit the second button and then the tangent button, 13 over 17, and your calculator will tell you that that angle was approximately 37 point, oh, it looks like 405 degrees, right? Now notice I'm rounding here. Um, we're going to have to round with these most of the time. We won't get an exact answer, but that angle is approximately that, and we'll round appropriately depending on the instructions. Let's say in that same triangle, I wanted to find angle B. Remember that the sides of the triangle are always referenced to the angle. So if we're looking at angle B, then here, the 17 is my opposite side, and the 13 is now my adjacent side. Here's something that's true. It's true that the tangent of angle B, whatever angle B is, is 17 over 13. But what I really want to know is what angle has a tangent that is 17 over 13. And the way I find out is by putting the inverse tangent in my calculator of 17 over 13. The inverse tangent of 17 over 13 is approximately 52.595. And by the way, if you take a minute to think about it, that's about 53 degrees, and this is about 37 degrees. And if you put 53 and 37 together, you get 90, which should make sense, right? Because angle A and angle B are in the same triangle, and the other 90 degrees is taken up by the right angle. That's actually a little hint about why we have a sine and a cosine, but we will cover that in a future video. So that's really all inverse trigonometric functions are. They're a way for us to figure out what an angle is if we know some of the sides of a right triangle. We can ask what the, what the angle is with any, it doesn't matter which sides we have because we have the sine, cosine, and tangent, and we now have the inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. So let's take a look at how this would work out in a simple example. So here we've got a triangle we want to solve for theta. So as always, the first thing we'll do is figure out what sides are what. Straight across from theta, that's our opposite side. And of course, this is the hypotenuse. So what can we do with an opposite and a hypotenuse? That would be sine. So here's a true statement. The sine of theta is the opposite 8 over the hypotenuse 17. So this is true. It's just not helpful because I can't cross multiply and solve here. I need to know what theta is. So the way that I get at theta is by using the inverse sine function. I need to ask the question, what angle has a sine of 8 over 17? Fortunately, we have a way to ask our calculator. The way is the inverse sine. So we're simply going to ask our calculator inverse sine of 8 over 17. That is to say, we're going to ask the calculator what angle has a sine of 8 over 17. You're going to hit the second key first so that you get inverse sine, and then when you type in 8 over 17, the calculator will give you approximately 28.072. Theta is approximately 28.072 degrees. Okay. So that's an example with sine. Let's take another look at another triangle here. This time, theta is up here. Across from it, the opposite side, well, we actually don't know. This is still the hypotenuse, because it's across from the 90, and this is the adjacent. 
So what can we do with an adjacent side and a hypotenuse? The cosine of theta is equal to 12 over 21. Again, true, but not helpful. I need to know what theta is. So we're going to ask the calculator, what angle has a cosine of 12 over 21? And the way we ask that is with the inverse cosine. So we're going to hit the second key and then cosine and inverse cosine of 12 over 21. So theta is about 55.150. And that's it. I mean, pretty simple, right? Let's take a look at another one. Here we've got theta up here on the triangle again. Across from it is our opposite side. And then we do not have the hypotenuse, but we do have the adjacent side. So what can we do with an opposite and an adjacent side? Yeah, that's tangent. So here's a true statement. The tangent of theta is the opposite side over the adjacent side, 14 over 7. But again, what I want to know is what's theta. So I need to ask the calculator, what angle has a tangent of 14 over 7? And the way we ask that is with the inverse tangent. So you hit the second button first, so you can pull up inverse tangent. You're going to type in inverse tangent of 14 over 7, and it's going to give you approximately 63.435. Right, so that's our angle. Theta is about 63.435. And we'll do one more example just for good measure here. This time theta is up here, so we're going to look across from it in the triangle. That's our opposite side. This is the hypotenuse. With an opposite and a hypotenuse, we can use the sine. So we're going to start by writing a true statement that the sine of theta is 13 over 23. What we're looking for is theta. So really, we need to ask a question. What is the angle that has a sine of 13 over 23? And the way we ask that is putting sine inverse into our calculator. So again, it's second sine to get to that. And then 13 over 23. And our calculator will tell us approximately 34.417. Now, of course, when you're doing a problem like this, you should always round appropriately. Pay attention to the instructions. If it says find theta to the nearest degree, in this case, we would say that's 34 degrees flat. So always pay attention to rounding instructions. They love to get you for that on the standardized tests. Quick recap, these three inverse trigonometric functions, inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent, they undo the original function. So they allow us to ask a question. That question is, what's the angle that has a sine of whatever you put in here? Or what's the angle that has a cosine of whatever you put in? Or a tangent of whatever you put in? And another way we like to say this in mathematics is that the inverse sine of x is the angle whose sine is x. So it doesn't matter which of these two you think about, as long as you have an understanding of this idea that you're trying to undo the original sine function and get back to the angle. We use these anytime we're looking to find the angle, but we already know the sides in the triangle. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, feel free to leave a comment below, and as always, have a great day.